declarative language than, it, than a, um, uh, where you declare what you want it to be rather than a procedural language where you're going to say, this is how the machine should actually implement this query. So if, for instance, instead of having um, first building this Cartesian product of all the columns and then filtering, which um, it, it does it in a smarter way. So it will look at the constraints and then figure out this um, uh, um, a, a, a plan of how it's going to do the query. And then it will execute the plan. And it will probably be a nested set of loops of iterating through one table and then iterating through next table and so on. But it can be, it's allowed to be smarter about how it's actually going to execute this. And so different database engines um, uh, do a better job at doing this query planning. But actually, it can be relatively efficient to do it. Um, in addition to simply iterating through all of the columns, um, by saying what the primary key is in the column, the databases often will make the, what are called indices, which are more efficient data structures for jumping right to the value that you would want. So they're, um, they don't ha uh, if it's laid out in disk, they don't have to go through all of the data in the table. They can go into a shorter representation in the index. So in any sense, using the indices and using uh, the, the constraints, it can do this query planning to give you back what the, the tables are. So if you have an exceptionally complicated query, sometimes the query plan isn't quite right, and you can go in and inspect what the query plan will be. But for the most part, you can assume that, that uh, if you say what you want, it will go and figure out how to get the data out of the database and give it to you. OK. Um, so one uh, thing that you may object to with this format is that uh, data stored in tables is limiting, that there's a way some data say, um, coordinates in R3 that you may not necessarily want to store in just a, a table, that you may want to store them in like a three-dimensional thing. So um, one of the common ways to, to represent data in tables is through this uh, wide versus long representation of data. Um, I, um, I think this is a useful concept. And so um, uh, this is slightly transcendental, but I think it's worth um, um, going down. So the idea is that, um, let's say you had um, uh, subjects and experiments, and you, for each experiment you had uh, um, each, su each subject was going to do the experiment. So in this case, uh, it's a two-dimensional uh, thing but where you have, um, for each of the experiments, each of the subjects. Um, so in this case, you could have a third dimension would be, um, say, if uh, there was another parameter to the, to the experiment, then you could say, do the experiment with all the different parameters. So in any sense, you could have a, a higher dimensional uh, table in this in this wide format, and then uh, to convert it into the long format, which was just a table, you would have um, for each of the dimensions you would have a column, and then the value would be another column in in the table. So in this case, you would have for subject one in experiment one you would have the value, and for subject one experiment two you would have the the value. But if you had a third dimension, say the parameter, you could add that as a third column before you had the result. So you could have subject one, experiment one, parameter one, for instance, and so on. So in this sense, uh, a, a wide diversity of data can actually be expressed as a table. And what this allows you to do is, is have, um, since each column is a particular dimension, it, um, doing the constraints between the tables is easier to, to express. So you could say, give, us, give me all of the subjects that scored better at uh, the experiment uh, for experiment C than, than um, other people. Does anybody have a Mac power cord I can plug in? I think that's why it's turning. Yeah, right there. Uh, cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, OK, um, so uh, some projects have arbitrarily complicated schemas. Uh, I found this. Uh, this is the Bugzilla database. And so each of these is the data in each of the different arrows. Um, oh, I think we're under control. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so uh, there's this uh, data modeling um, way to represent tables and with connections between them. So different arrows correspond to different types of constraints, uh, whether they're one-to-one uh, -one or one-to-many and so on. But in any sense, um, there's, uh, this, this, the query language for the schemas is well supported, and uh, many data modeling projects have, uh, ha that have schemas represented. There's tools to look at them and to, to do them. Um, so uh, I'm this, I've purposely made this too small to read, so we're not going to get into the details of Bugzilla. But I just wanted to say that if you have complicated data and you didn't um, and you wanted to store it for some length of time, then there's relationships between the different aspects of the data. Then databases is a natural way to do this. 
so the vision, or one of the ways that I could picture uh, relational databases used within Rosetta, is that you could picture having a database that, say, lives on um, um, as a data store, and you have a computational cluster or resources that are going to be running Rosetta protocols. So you would store your simulations for, say, your, your thesis project in the relational databases, experimental data, structure predictions, different analysis parts, and uh, for different aspects of your project. And then to run simulations, you would uh, query data out of the database using a structured query language, perform some computation, and then store the results back into the database. So this is uh, sort of an, uh, another aspect of job distribution where you're using the database as um, sort of the long-term storage of the results and using the database to, uh, to manage the, um, what you're going to do the next computation on. And then once you put it back in, what type of analysis you want to do on it. So then if you were going to do some other particular type of structure analysis, you could do another query out of the database, do the analysis, and then maybe put the results back in. And you have it all in one place. And it's um, stored rather than, in, say, in a file system um, in, a, in a more structured manner. So uh, to, to sort of give you a feel for how this could possibly be, um, I was thinking it might be fun to uh, go through what sort of schema you might want to do for a directed evolution experiment. Um, so I know if some of you are doing this, um, and so you may uh, be, uh, help us clarify what are the actual aspects of a directed evolution experiment. But in my impression is, is that if you start with, say, initial scaffold or scaffold uh, protein structures, say a native structure, then if you do a Rosetta ensemble of structures, where you're doing a sequence design, perhaps with maybe flexible backbone of some sort, that you end up with an ensemble of sequences that you may want to try uh, to express. Um, since you uh, can't simply try them all, uh, one thing you could do is come up with codon diversity uh, that, that covers, uh, in the theoretical diversity, uh, many of the predictions that you came out of the, of the ensemble. And then through the selection experiment, say yeast display, uh, with the codon diversity that, sh that, you've, uh, that you've used the simulations to, um, to define, that you would end up with a, a, a whole range of sequences at the end of the day. And then you have these sequences and say from these, you could then filter back down to initial set of scaffolds or, or do another round of simulations. So um, maybe we could think about what would be the data that you would need to store for this type of project. Uh, maybe you want to take a sec to think about it and then we'll um, Maybe do a sketch it out on, on um, this board here. Okay, so what would be uh, one table that you perhaps would want to store that would contain data? Okay. So. Um, what other sequences would you, would you want to store all the sequences into one table, or do you think having the wild type sequences would be separate from the other types of sequences? I think the wild type should be in these tables for the, the, the mutation. OK. So uh, wild type. And what sort of data would be stored in this table? Anybody else? Um, are there other types of sequences that we would want to be storing, or is this the only type of sequences that we've got? Is that the sequence that comes out of Rosetta so we could have Rosetta, Rosetta sequences for the Rosetta simulations? OK. Cool. Activity. So that would be with the wild type sequences, maybe? Yeah, I mean, like, with the wild type, you probably have that. Is that, uh, okay. So, so maybe uh, we would, this would be another table of experimental data that would have a foreign key into the wild type sequences. Um, so what type of experiments would you picture that you would want to have? Um, 
So maybe perhaps each of these would be a column and they would have the, the value in some units. Okay. And then this would have a, a sequence. So then this would connect with, with the wild type sequence, say. Okay. Okay, what other data would we have to model here? Anybody else? Okay, what, what, uh, um, this has so far all been sequences. Do we have any of uh, structure information? How is that going to come into the play? And those are going to be connected with the Rosetta sequences, I guess, right? So it's going to have a confirmation and a sequence. So there's going to be some, some connection between these. So we would have another table of, say, nat of like experimentally validated scaffolds or native structures. Scaffolds, and then what would you have for that? Confirmation? A crystal structure or something else, maybe? Okay, so let's say we were halfway through the simulation and now we've, got all, we've populated all this data, we've done one round of simulations, we've, uh, we've, we've done the selection study, we've got the, um, say, a, a new set of sequences, and now we would like to take this data and form a new Rosetta uh, uh, prediction protocol to, say, um, re-simulate them to see if they were um, better than, than, than they were before. If the, if the, Say the sequences that came out gave structures that were better energy than, than originally. Like if the selection was actually um, doing something that Rosetta recognized or not. Then could we use the, um, the, the scores uh, to compare against, and then also the, the output um, sequences from the, from the selection and, and repopulate the tables? So you could say that the, the, the each um, input to a Rosetta simulation came from a particular scaffold. So then you could ask things like, uh, for this particular scaffold, for this particular uh, simulation, is the score better than um, than it was originally um, for for this second round of simulations? So um, you could picture storing all this data in, in the uh, file system in a variety of, of files. Right? You could have uh, FASTA files for the sequences and uh, directories of structures. But if you didn't have the connections between the different data, it wouldn't be uh, readily uh, to be able to, to do the type of uh, submitting the new jobs to getting the new data back to doing the, the analysis. So it, um, if this grows to be a large project and you go through multiple rounds, and keeping them all in one place and organized, it might be a reasonable way to store the data. OK, so um, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, how data is modeled in this structured query language and, and relational databases. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and there's uh, lots of good references on how this. It's a pretty mature field, and there's good uh, uh, references to the SQL language. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, database engines and how the data is stored um, uh, to be able to be used. So the first is the SQLite database. 
And this is, um, it's a uh, whole database is contained in a .db3 file. So it lives in the file system as simply a file. And if you email it to somebody or, or put it in Dropbox, then you get the database and you have it all ready to go. Um, to access the data, if you just try to open it up, it looks like binary. It's compressed. It has indices. It's, um, it's uh, laid out in a way that's it's not directly accessible. But what you can do is open the SQLite command line. And from that, you can type in SQL queries. And then it will give you back uh, tables. So you can run this um, interactively um, from the command line, or you can use it as just a, a shell command, and it will t return a table. So you can get the, ta the data back out of the database. It's not locked in there forever. But if you want to combine certain aspects of the data and just get back pieces of it, uh, you don't have to get it all back at once. It's, um, you can just do the queries to get parts of it. Um, as far yes? So it, it retains the, the schema information of the, how the tables are defined, and then it has all of the data in all of the tables. It would contain like structured data? Uh, it could, yeah. So um, uh, there's different ways to represent it. So for instance, if you just took the PDB file, you could make that the value uh, in a cell, like you could picture in a table. Uh, so that could be the structure information. Or you could spread out the structure information into um, Certain, like the backbone angles in one table and the sidechain angles in another table or the atomic coordinates in a third and the PDB information in another. So it's sort of spread the data out to be able to analyze it in a, a more um, interactive way. Um, so there's, um, I'll get into in the next part of how we can use databases to do job input and output with Rosetta and the format that we use to, to store the, the structures in the database and get them back out. OK. so. Um, from the uh, perspective of, of accessing it through C++, um, SQLite is the free license. Um, and it just consists of a single header file. And we distribute that with Rosetta. So it's in the external directory. And, uh, and every time you compile Rosetta, you're also compiling the SQLite database, which means that it's great for unit testing. It's great for integration tests. It's always there. If you write database code, um, you have a database format that you can use and play with and try. Um, it's, I would recommend it if you're going to get started with databases to get started with SQLite because it has very little configuration. It just works. And, um, and the, the biggest limitation is that you're using the file system to manage this data. So as you scale up to the size of a cluster, um, writing to the database um, means that you're writing to the file system. And it, um, file systems may not be optimized for this type of input and output. And so it can be uh, hard on uh, fragile file systems, especially if they're network uh, file systems that are available on a variety of different computers. So um, as you start scaling your project, um, this you may outgrow the capacity of a SQLite database. Uh, I've been using them for my projects. And on our file system, um, I, it seems no problem to scale them up to 10, 15, 20 gigs. But past that, they become um, a bit, um, it's a bit heavy on, uh, for the, for the um, projects. So generally, what I'll do is if I have one simulation or one uh, round of experiments, I'll store the data in a DB3 database, and then it's all there contained in one place. And then if I want to get at the details of it, I would open up the database and go in and look at the data. OK, so to, to scale things up um, further, there's the uh, MySQL and Postgres, and there's others, but I'm just going to talk about these two. These are a client-server database architecture. So uh, the server is the database, and it lives on a particular computer. And it uh, opens up ports in the same way that like a web server would open up ports. And um, client programs uh, that can connect to the database to read and write data from it. So in, in usually, if you have a cluster, additional computer near the cluster would be running the database server. And then the, um, the cores on the cluster can communicate back and forth with the database. This is, say, how. Um, like a, a web server uh, often have data associated with the website. You would connect to the web server, and then it would connect to the, web, the database server and go back. So uh, to connect to um, a database server, the client application needs to know the username, the host, the port, and the password uh, to set it up. And um, the client program uh, for MySQL and Postgres, there's libraries um, that are, are easy to get from, from these projects. And uh, we, we're not able to distribute them, but there's uh, tutorials on how to put them into the right folder 
And then to compile them with Rosetta, you use the extras equals MySQL or extras equals Postgres. And then you have uh, um, access to um, using these backends. Um, the, the scaling capacity of these backends uh, scales very well. You can add more hardware, and it allows it to handle more uh, inputs and output requests simultaneously. Um, and in order to support this um, uh, more capacity, um, they generally have, um, there's more configuration that's involved. Um, there's different ways of, of uh, specifying, uh, say, how the data is laid out in the tables. Um, and also it uses type information, and it checks it. So it, there's more consistency checks. Uh, it's a bit like moving from Python to C++ in the way that the Python doesn't check types, but C++ may. So this is, in some ways, more professional, and it, and it scales. But just to get up and going, if, say, you don't have uh, admin access to your cluster, it may be difficult to actually install a, a database a, a server. But perhaps um, it turns out that your lab is using databases extensively, or there's resources that you can use. Um, then you can install a MySQL or Postgres database, and then get access to it. Uh, in our lab, we recently worked out with our cluster to buy a piece of hardware and put it next to our cluster to run a Postgres server. And so we can access it from our lab, and we can ask, access it from the cluster. And so this is where we can read and write data from our simulations to the cluster. And then when we're done, we can access it from our workstations in our lab to get the data back out. OK, so um, just to reiterate, why not just put everything in comma-separated value files? Um, as you model more complex data, uh, there's relationships between the data that can't simply be captured with the file system. The file system has a natural hierarchy where folders are nested inside of folders, but that only indicates this uh, sort of one direction with no loops. Uh, so there, you can model more complex relationships with relational database schemas. And what I found is that other than using simple readme files to indicate what's actually in the data, uh, or relying on the header columns of a, of a, um, of a comma-separated value table, using the database schema enforces what the data actually consists of. And I find that, that having that consistency is, is important for maintaining data, data integrity over the lifetime of a simulation that may last a year or two or more, or multiple people. So by t working up front what is the de data representation, can be very important to making sure that the project may, goes in a very smooth way and you don't lose data that, that you can't remember what this data file was in the past. Also, since it's um, uh, in binary, it can be uh, more compressed than simply keeping it all as text files. And, or if it's zipped, then you have to unzip it to look at it. So it's, um, as the data grows, it, there's a bit more overhead in just learning how to use the databases, but it gives back in uh, multiple orders of magnitude um, what, you, what you can do with your data. Additionally, to being able to model more complex data than what you can do with CSV files, uh, a significant benefit of using a database is that they're more robust. So the, the libraries that are used to, uh, to manage the backends have uh, what's called um, atomic commits. So if you make an action to the database, it uh, has ways of rolling back the, the, the action if it didn't go through successfully. So if, for instance, if there's a crash or if there's some way of, of um, of doing an incomplete result, you won't end up with corrupted data. And this seems like it's not such a big deal for small simulations, but as the simulations grow, if you end up with corrupted data, then trying to handle that becomes an increasing problem. And uh, it's, it's one of these sort of things like backing up your computer, like you don't have to worry about it until there's a problem, but as soon as the problem, you really wish you had it working correctly. So atomic commits are, are, are extremely important, um, and oftentimes you wouldn't have that unless you did careful um, data processing um, uh, code to actually read and write from, a, from a, um, a, a data in the file system. Also, because you've done this better job of modeling the data, you can actually use that modeling as constraints for if you try to do something silly. So by enforcing the foreign key constraints, for instance, you can always be sure that you're always going to add a residue that there's a structure information associated with it. It's, you're not going to input a, a residue that, that doesn't correspond to any structure. So by maintaining these foreign key constraints, you have better data integrity, and you, and you have more confidence that the data you're modeling is complete or actually makes sense. So you can say with more confidence to your collaborators or to your published people that this is actually the data that, that we've got, the real experiments that we've got. And finally, I'll reiterate that um, file systems can choke under high load. 
And so um, reading and writing to the file system is just as problematic um, with SQLite as if you're just doing it with the, with the comma separated value tables. The last uh, point of why databases um, may be better than simply do modeling your data effectively in the file system yourself is that uh, there's been a, a significant amount of effort put into uh, making them fast access from and to the databases. In particular, um, data uh, on the disk um, is efficiently read in a sequential fashion. So if you, if, when it goes to read data from the disk, rather than simply reading just a, the bit that you ask for, oftentimes it'll, a, it'll grab what you want plus everything else in um, a whole big chunk around it. And the reason it does this is that, um, say you ask for something, usually you'll want to ask for something that's next to it or related to it. And so if it can pull it all back at once, then it, can, it appears to be working faster. Um, so to take advantage of this, uh, data is often stored in these B trees, which is a special type of tree that's, that's um, uh, set up to support very little disk access in order to read and write data to the, data, to, uh, to the storage. So in addition to B trees, uh, also they have these indices, which can allow you to more efficiently uh, do random access into the data. So um, not that it's impossible to write these efficient data structures, but um, they're relatively complicated, and, and it would be essentially reinventing the wheel. And so since these are mature pieces of software of using relational databases, engines, that you can take advantage of this by, by uh, using them to, model, to store your data. OK, um, so now I want to tell you a little bit about the database support in Rosetta. Uh, this is work that um, myself and Sam and Tim and a variety of other people have worked on. Um, it started about two years ago, I guess. And, um, and we've come up with an architecture for interacting with the different database backends and allowing the support within Rosetta. Um, so this is the layout of where the code is. So the SQLite database engine is distributed with Rosetta. But the MySQL client and the Postgres clients you have to put into the external directories yourself if you want to use them. Uh, we use the CCP, CPPDB library, um, which um, is under the LGPL license, and it's also an external, uh, to um, support subtle differences between the uh, API, or the application programmer's interface, between these different clients. And so the CPPDB supports a, a more uniform interface to these backends that um, makes it easier for us to not have to um, to work with the different syntaxes that these APIs support. In theory, CPPDB supports other backends. Um, there's the ODBC, which is a more gener generic database pipeline that can connect to other types of databases. Um, but we haven't worked out uh, those backends. But for instance, if you're working on a database backend on your cluster that, it, that wasn't one of these, then in theory, you could extend this, uh, this layer to support it. OK, so on top of these layers, um, there are, uh, are a number of components. So the first is this database session manager. And what this does is it maintains a reference to a connection to the database. So for um, the SQLite database, this is simply just like an open file connection, or you can think of it like that. But for these, the client server connections, this opens up like a, almost like a shell terminal. Or, but it, it, um, it establishes a connection with the database. And then you can read and write from the database to get data in and out of it. So the session represents the state of the connection with it. So it's, it has information about what is the back end, um, whether it's open, whether it's read access only, and so on. So um, for almost all of the interactions with the database, you have this sort of session object that you um, hand to whatever you're going to do it with. And then the information is, is um, handed to the session object to, to do the, um, the actual interaction. And I'll show you more details about how this works in the next few slides. Um, although uh, the SQL language is um, relatively standardized, there are subtle differences between the backends of what aspects of the language are actually supported. And unfortunately, um, these edge cases uh, are not as well encapsulated as they could be. So it's not um, like we talked about in the first day, that interacting with a piece of software, you hope that it will have a very consistent, reliable interface. But if you're interacting with it and you don't know which backend you'll be working with, then you would have to include special if statements, like if I'm on SQLite, then I can do this. And if I'm on Postgres, I can do that. So one of the biggest um, inconsistencies between the database backends 
is in the language that they have for how you define the schemas or how you define the table definitions. So uh, Tim wrote a schema generator, which is a framework for basically building these strings that uh, are the create table statements about how to specify which columns, the primary keys, and the foreign key constraints. Um, it uh, essentially maps one-to-one -to, -one to the, the concepts. It's just very subtly in the syntax and what, what's supported in the backend. Um, on top of the session manager and, re and related to the schema generator is a whole file and a whole collection of utility functions that are used to make interacting with the databases more convenient. So um, I'll get into some of these utilities in the next few slides. But the idea is that the Rosetta modules can interact with the schema generator, the SQL utils, and using a session, session manager, or if you need to, with the CCPDB, um, to interact with the databases. So it, hopefully it'll be a relatively natural experience to, uh, within the Rosetta modules to actually interact with the database. And in my experience, um, opening up a, a file to read from the file and to write from the file, it's actually substantially easier to read and write from a database. It, um, you don't have to uh, specify how the data is laid out in the file. You don't have to do checks for certain things. Um, and to read and write data out of the database, you have all the types there. You know what the table is going to consist of. And so it's relatively straightforward to it. So even if you're simply thinking, OK, I just need to read and write from a file, I would consider reading and writing from a SQLite database because it's easier and you'll have more consistent view of your data. And you can use SQL at the end of the day to, to get access to it and do more with it. OK, so this is the locations of where the code is located. Um, this is an external in the DBIO. This is in the CPBDB uh, folder inside of the DBIO. The session manager is in utility because it doesn't rely on the option system. And this is in basic because it does rely on the option system and some other configuration information about Rosetta. I apologize about the inconsistency of the DBIO, the SQL database, and the database. Um, refactoring projects abound. OK, okay um, uh, for your reference, um, the SQL Light 3 API and uh, CPPDB, um, here are some links to that. But, uh, but SQL uh, SQL references is easy to look at and relatively easy to understand. So that's not a bad place for it, to look for it. OK. Um, since uh, at some level uh, you need to understand the CPPDB API, there's basically three major objects that, um, that are used. One is the session, which I've discussed. It represents the active connection to the database, and you basically pass it into whatever function you want to deal with the database. A statement is, represents a parsed SQL statement. So before I was showing you text, but in general what you'll do is you'll take the text and you'll prepare a statement and this becomes an object that represents, in some ways, compiled language. And so you will pass the statement to the database, and the database then knows what to do with the statement. Generally, if you're writing to the database, the statement that you'll write um, won't return anything. But if you're asking for a query with, say, a select statement, then you'll get back a result set. And the result set basically gives you an iterator to the rows, and then you say to the next, and you get the next row, and next, and you get the next row. So it allows you to iterate through the data of the table. And it's relatively easy to access. Uh, once you get the result set, it just um, uh, you have your data there, and you can get at it. So it's um, very easy to, to read data back out of the database. OK, um, I mentioned handling variations in the back end. Um, uh, some of the common failures, um, that these are handled with utility functions. And then the schema generator uh, handles some of the SQL differences. OK. Um, OK, so now I'm going to get into uh, some of the utility functions that are supported and sort of why we've done them this way. So um, three big ones that uh, if you work with databases that you, you will use are uh, safely prepare statement, and safely write to database, and safely read from database. So this basically covers the standard workflows that you would need to use to interact with the database. The safely prepare statement, you pass in a session, a string, and it returns a statement. To safely write to the database, you simply pass the statement. And um, I suppose you also, since it already knows what the session is, because it's built into the statement, then it just writes to the database and you're done. Uh, the safely read from the database, you pass it the statement and it returns a result set. And then you can interact with the result set. So wh why do we need um, the safety, safety or safely write to the database? Um, the basic idea is that 
um, there's a, a statement.exec function in the CPP interface, and it will try to, to execute the statement. And if it works, then it just returns. But we've put it into a try catch block because the exec can throw an exception. And so um, I haven't listed here all of the exceptions that can catch. But for instance, if, if there's a deadlock in the back end, then it will wait some random amount of time, um, and then it will try it again. And if it tries it too many times, then it will exit. So it, this logic of um, handling deadlocks and some of the other common ways, like if the disk is full and so on, um, are wrapped up inside of the safely write to database. And depending on the, what type of error it is, it will catch the exception that the, um, the CPPDB uh, uh, backend or the, that library will throw. And it will either exit, throw a new exception, or retry, or something of that sort. So essentially, um, by calling the safely write to database, it's as if you're calling the exact function, except it's handling some of the common failure cases uh, in a more reasonable way. Okay, so the column uh, or the, the schema generator represents these different objects. There's a column con uh, constraints, a foreign key, an index, a primary key, a schema, and something off the bottom of the screen, which you probably don't need to care about. Okay, um, so uh, if you do end up writing your own schemas, um, Look for examples of how the schema generator works. Um, if you understand the basic syntax, then the, using the schema generator is pretty straightforward. There's a one-to-one -one mapping of the syntax to the schema generator uh, syntax. OK. Um, the primary use of databases so far has been through uh, these feature databases. And uh, this is what's going to be used for database uh, input and output and also some of the structure analysis stuff that I've been doing and a, a bunch of other people have found useful as well. So um, the, the basic motivation for this was we have crystal structures coming in, we have structure pred predictions coming in, and then say new candidate predictions um, coming in with an adjusted score function. So we take these structures, we put them into a feature database, and then this is how we're doing the analysis. So we'll extract uh, subsets of features conditioned upon um, uh, local geometry, say looking at the length of a hydrogen bond conditioned upon whether it's exposed to solvent or not or in a secondary structure or not. And then compare distributions and then make scientific benchmarks or adjust the score fun function. So we've sort of been iterating this cycle of making distributions and comparing them and using the feature database to uh, store the data. So for this, um, we've needed a way to take structures in and write out a variety of different local types of structure information. So we're calling them features, but the idea is that they capture local or, or organized parts of, of uh, molecular structure. So um, different levels of detail. So secondary structure information, hydrogen bonding, solvent exposure, and other things. And so uh, to, to wrap up each different part of structure, we've created this framework for uh, handling features. Um, so the way this is organized is that um, there is a base feature reporter class which I'll show you in the next slide. And then this is responsible for um, a set of tables in the database. And then within the database, there's a, this is the hierarchy. So one um, protocol table corresponds to the execution of the program. A batch corresponds to, um, say, a batch of structures that may be, if it's run in parallel, that may be different executions of the program, or if you are writing out to different databases within a single execution. And then for each structure, there's a bunch of uh, the feature data associated with it. So within a particular structure, um, it, it has all the secondary structure information, hydrogen bond information, atomic coordinates, torsion angles, and so on. So each feature reporter is a self-contained thing that you hand at a structure, and it interacts with the database. So these are the feature reporters th in, that we, in dark gray that we've implemented so far. And then light gray are some of the ones that I think would be interesting to do, but we haven't gotten to. So we've organized them by experimental data. So we have PDB information, chemical type information for atom types and residue types, one body information, like if they just deal with a single residue, such as the what is the residue, its confirmation, um, whether if it's a protein confirmation, then it, you can do it in a slightly more compressed way. Um, if it's just the backbone torsion angles, if it's buried, what its secondary structure is, um, there's another version of solvation that was based on hydrogen bonding, so there's a geometric solvation. Um, beta turns, um, whether or not there's the Rotomer-Boltzmann weight. 
And so there's a, a variety of these. And so if you're dealing with structure information or doing some sort of structure analysis, I think this is a, a, a nice extensible framework. And I hope you uh, explore it and try, try using it. Um, uh, so to give you an example for what uh, data uh, one of these feature reporters represents, the hydrogen one features has these tables. And these correspond to foreign keys into them. So there's a table for each hydrogen bond site, the donor or the acceptor. And there's a table for a hydrogen bond, which maps to a donor site and an acceptor site together. And then associated with a hydrogen bond, it has its geometric coordinates. So the distance between the donor and the acceptor and the different angles. And also the Leonard-Jones uh, uh, interactions between the, all the different atoms. Associated with a hydrogen bond site, it has the coordinates of the atoms of the site, uh, the PDB information for those atoms, and whether or not it's exposed to solvent and so on, uh, its B factor and other types. Um, these, uh, the hydrogen bond sites are in a residue, and uh, from this, these residues are in the structure, and those are in a batch. So that's how it connects to the rest of the database. So the hydrogen bond features represents these set of tables. And different feature reporters manage their own sets of tables. So uh, to do database, um, OK, so um, uh, the feature reporter base class uh, basically has these two functions. It's a bit like a mover in the sense that it's, um, it's a base class, and then you would implement a drive version of it to do what you want. So it has one function, write schema to DB, which takes in a database session and is responsible for writing whatever uh, initial schema table information it needs to to the database. Uh, and then it also has a function called report features, which gets a const reference to the pose, a struct ID, um, which is uh, computed when it figures out the structures table, a subset of residues, and then the session information. And it basically is allowed to do whatever it wants. But what it's expected to do is to write data to the database corresponding to some aspect of its structural confirmation. Um, to use this, uh, the primary way that, uh, to use it is through uh, the root report to DB mover within Rosetta scripts. So you define a mover, and you say which uh, feature reporters you want to use. And then um, as it uh, gets to the apply part of the protocol, it, for each uh, feature reporter, it hands the pose and the struct ID to it, and it allows the feature reporter to do whatever it wants. So if you're, say, doing a, a prediction protocol, then at the end, say you only want certain aspects of the information, like you want the RMSD to the native, you want uh, its solvation score, and maybe something about the interface, then you could collect just the types of information that you want and use those specific features and write that data out to the, to the database. So it's a, it's a flexible way to, to uh, store from a simulation certain aspects of the structural details that may be useful for you. Um, so uh, this is just a, a plot that we've gotten for looking at. Um, um, once we've gotten the data into the database, how we're doing the structural analysis, there's a whole bunch of R scripts that, that do queries to databases and bring them back. So using this framework of comparing distributions, um, this is uh, uh, distributions from the hydrogen mon stuff that Andrew and I have been working on. So what you're looking at here is um, if you look down a hydrogen bond acceptor uh, that is an sp2. So this is a carbonyl backbone or, um, uh, uh, or in the side chains with sp2. Um, uh, then um, this uh, angle here is in the plane of the sp2, and this is out of the plane where um, we're going around is, is a torsion angle about the, um, the base to carbonyl bond, say. Um, uh, and then uh, this is conditional upon being in an anti-parallel beta sheet or being in a parallel beta sheet. And the colors represent uh, density distributions. So um, what we see in, in the native structures in this column is that the um, uh, that they have the standard two-lobe pattern for an SP2 acceptor. It's either going to be uh, in one lobe or it's going to be in the other lobe, depending on um, the, uh, which, if it's a parallel or anti-parallel. Um, in the standard uh, score 12, there's no penalty on being where you are in this um, torsion parameter. And it uh, just measures how far away you are from the center. So this is the base, this is the base acceptor hydrogen angle as you move away from the center. 
And since it doesn't penalize being uh, where you are around, it smears this distribution out um, like this. So to get these structures from the natives, we took each of uh, about 6,000 structures and relaxed them. And this is the distribution that we got back. If we use our new hydrogen bond potential, then uh, the distributions look much closer to the natives. So this indicates to us that if we made one of these uh, predictions, that um, we would be less likely to screw up uh, a um, physically realistic confirmation if we used uh, the, the modified version of the potential. So in any sense, what, rather than getting into the details of hydrogen bonding, I'm showing you uh, ways that we've take, queried the data out of the database and done structural analysis with it. So to generate plots like these and using R, um, there's a, uh, these scripts are checked in, into Rosetta test slash features, and there's um, can, um, a, a lot of the analysis <coughs> tools are there. So if you want to do stuff like this, uh, please come talk to me. Um, uh, I want to tell you briefly about um, uh, how we do job distribution using the features. And the idea is that the, um, there's a subset of these features that correspond to roughly what's stored in a silent file. And uh, so when you use the database job inputter, or the database job outputter, it's going to read structure information out of tables that, that it can reconstruct the, the pose from. Or if you're going to write it, it's going to write those tables. So by using just a fixed set of tables, um, it is able to reconstruct the, the structures. Um, so if, for instance, it uses the protein residue confirmation and um, uh, the residue and, and a few more. OK. I think that's all that I have for you today about databases. If this is something that's interesting to you, please come talk to me or otherwise. Um, and I hope that it uh, is useful for your simulations and using Rosetta. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, um, so on our file system, the, the question is, um, uh, what are the limits of writing in parallel to a database in, in a job distribution setting? Um, so it, it is dependent on the hardware that you have available, is I think is the, the short answer. Um, on our cluster, we have a good file system, and I've been using SQLite databases. And so in that case, what I do is, if I run a thousand parallel jobs at once, I have each of them write to a separate database so they don't crush each other. And then at the end, I merge the databases together. So the other approach. The other approach, which is probably more reasonable and probably so the one you should listen to. Is a terrible file system. So if we try to use SQLite at all, it will actually break the file system. So um, we have a My MySQL server. And on our MySQL server, um, I have run, I usually use run my jobs so I have 125 CPUs per job and I've been able to run about, or sorry, use 32 CPUs per job and I can, it's able to parallelize up to about like, I can have 300 connections running to one database at once before you start to end up with net locking problems. And the amount that you can parallelize will depend entirely on the limitations of your, basically it's, it's a network overhead problem. Um, so the faster the network connection between your cluster and your SQL server, the more resources your SQL server has, the more connections you can make. Um, our SQL server has 16 or 20 cores and about 100 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Uh, there's also, if you're trying to parallelize or have a lot of connections and you're writing um, poses, there are things you can do to, uh, there's an option that will write fewer rows, so it sort of compacts all of the atom information into one row for residue and so one row for atom, and that can speed things up a lot. But I would use MySQL if you're having, I know you don't have to merge your databases, which is good because databases aren't really, like, you can merge them, but it's kind of like a thing. Yeah, so it, it, probably the right answer is to... It, and if you want to talk about MySQL, we can totally, yeah. I love talking about MySQL. The, um, uh, one thing to, to clarify, Sam was saying, is that the way it's currently set up each node is going to be reading and writing to the database separately. And so the, um, the limitation is on the database side of how many parallel connections can it keep open at once. And so it will, um, it will field all, the, all the, the connections that it can, and then it will return busy when, it's, when it can't handle anymore. 
So this is sort of a denial of service attack of sorts if you have enough connections going. Um, if uh, in theory we could, uh, in the same way that we did the MPI file buff, um, we could push all the data to a couple nodes that were interacting with the database, um, which may scale even larger if you had limited database connection resources. That would be a really good project. Um, but that hasn't been implemented, but it could be done if that was, um, say, something you're interested in. And in, uh, in a practical application, do you still keep the, the output files together and the database annotations in an additional way of storing data and making it accessible? Or do you, you don't lose the balance files or you can't replace them completely? So why do we still use silent files? Is the yeah, or yeah, or you have to use them. Right? You cannot completely ignore them. Yeah. So. Um, one, one thing that uh, comes up is, okay, why not just get rid of silent file support altogether and just go to databases? One nice thing about silent files is that um, because they are, um, it gives up this ability to randomly access the data and it, and it has a very compact format for specific things. Actually, the silent files are, take up slightly less memory than this format of representing the structures, even though it stores about the same types of information. And also, if you know you're just going to uh, read through your structures linearly and you don't really care about accessing them or additional structural information, um, storing them linearly in disk without any overhead is actually pretty efficient. So um, there are, are many applications where silent files are still a reasonable way to, to store stuff. Um, this I, I w is particularly useful if you know you're going to be doing um, sort of uh, analysis after the fact. To, to, um, to do another rounds of, of analysis on top of the, the data that you get out. If you know you just want to do simulations and take those simulations and that's it, then silent files um, is a reasonable way to go. Um, also, silent files are, are a reasonable way to serialize data between jobs. So in that sense, serial, silent files will live on. OK, thank you very much.